ASEAN Breakfast Call. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Good morning, this is Grace. And you're listening to, of course, our ASEAN Breakfast Call. We will start our session uh, segment today with more news from Southeast Asia. And apparently today we have quite many news from Indonesia. Oh, apparently so. But before we move to Indonesia, do you know, uh, pro- we have already reported, but just for you, for the audience to guess, do you know that um, Mark Zuckerberg visited Indonesia a few days ago before Jokowi was inaugurated as the current president of Indonesia? So he also went to China. And I was I was watching this YouTube clip of him speaking in Chinese. I was really impressed. That's really impressive, him being a American and then... Uh, a white guy. <laughs> yeah, a white guy. And nonetheless, he um, actually had a will to learn a new language. And he could actually speak Chinese quite fluently. Apparently so. He can speak Chinese quite fluently. And because of that... Uh, I, I personally, I mean, I can speak Mandarin. So, but for him to simply learn Chinese from 2010 until now 2014 and be able to answer question and uh, to be at a Q&A session with just answering all of the questions in Chinese, it shows that he he is a really dedicated student and also very determined. Very determined, and probably his wife have done a fair bit of teaching, <laughs> Mandarin exactly. teaching on him. And uh, talking about uh, being Mark Zuckerberg and Indonesia, I realized that in one area that is interesting about uh, Indonesia is because Indonesia f- first family is similar to the... F- to Mark Zuckerberg, they are humble, they don't really flaunt that wealth that much, and they are a family that really uh, care more about their work rather than about creating this opulent lifestyle. If you look at Mark Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan, they they seem to be quite humble in terms of the way they dress, the way they uh, carry their lives. They don't really flaunt their wealth that much. And the same that you can see with Indonesia's first family, they somehow shun excessive lifestyles and won't parade wealth. The same thing. Yes, that's correct. Where um, uh, when people are at their high position, they tend to live off uh, with a really uh, higher lifestyle. Uh, when it comes to food, automobile, fashion, housing, it uh, everything just uh, upgrades. However, um, in the case of uh, Indonesian. Um, um, case, uh, President uh, Joko Widodo is different. His lifestyle is very humble, modest, and he knows the, how to uh, live at the moderation. And if you look at this, uh, if you compare the the sons and daughters of Joko Widodo with the sons and daughters of former President Susilo Bambang Yuhoyono, you might see a, a huge contradiction because the sons, uh, the kids, uh, the children of President, uh, former President Susilo Bambang Yuhoyono have no reservation to showing off their luxurious lifestyle. But when it comes to Joko Widodo, it seems like he's more, uh, I mean, his kids is more into their own thing. Like, for example, I'm just giving one example. Uh, Iriana is never seen wearing, carrying branded items. Her dresses are mostly purchased in Tana Abang, Southeast Asia's largest textile and clothing market in central Jakarta. That is his wife. And even his son is more focused towards uh, the catering work rather than, you know, Busying, uh, partying, or being jet setting with other socialites. Exactly. So that's what's been happening uh, when it comes to Joko Widodo's family members. That they are uh, very focused on living in a small, uh, small and humble lifestyle, and also that also shows to the public how dedicated they are to the government, and also how they can mind their own business uh, rather than showing off their lifestyle to people, and then by uh, spending a lot of money on certain. Uh, unnecessary things that the public can uh, actually uh, can voice out for, and <clears throat> also uh, in addition to that, the other uh, the other um, 
child, he's also just minding his own business. He's not even fond of latest Apple iPhone or even the, the uh, uh, latest the automobile like Land Rover as, uh, SUVs or even high fashion. Yes, an 18-year-old child like any young kid, he, I mean, he can afford any luxury but he choose not to in fact he said that everything is going on like usual ever since his father became the president and no one no one at school actually see him differently it also remains the same it shows how humble the family is and in fact it is a culture within the family uh, that Joko Jokowi has been and his family has been raised to believe that modesty is a paramount importance and ideal that is largely lacking among high-ranking public officials who tend to provide their family members with luxuries and privileges. The same thing would be in Malaysia. You can see the, the contrast between those family that are well-off and those that are not. They usually they would flaunt their wealth as excessively as they can. That, uh, that's right. And then also, this could be a very good example to the other politicians and as well as to the people of Indonesia that how uh, the, um, a person at the high ranking can live life like this. So uh, people wouldn't uh, believe that if Jokowi spends a certain amount of money on certain things, they will believe that and that they will actually uh, trust him entirely on that. But you know, there, there's one thing that Jokowi would not hesitate to spend as much money as possible. And that is on education. education. Because Indonesia, just like Malaysia, uh, they have a huge problem with their education system. It's not really the best. So he do, wouldn't mind sending his kids. For example, he has a kid called Gibran. Uh, um, he studied... Uh, he. he he sent his kid to study in Singapore and Australia during his high school and undergraduate years. So he really won the best out of his kid. And in fact, another kid, uh, Kahiyang, also recently completed his undergraduate degree in food technology at state-run Sebelih Marit University in Surakarta. While Kesang, like his elder brother, completed high school years in Singapore. Singapore has one of the best education in the world. Uh, it, it is always one of the top three rankings uh, besides other countries like like uh, Finland and sh- and also from USA as and well. And from yeah, and from other developed nations. So it seems like when it comes to education, he wouldn't mind spending a bomb. But when it comes to Excessive lifestyle is not part of their family culture. So even when they uh, speak about themselves to the public, um, Ariana, she can just uh, simply say, we're just letting everything flow naturally. There's nothing special about us. And even Jokowi's mother, who's all 71, she flew uh, to Jakarta for his uh, inauguration ceremony in econ- uh, economic class. Wow. Yeah. Economy class, that's unheard of for any president, right? Yes. Uh, for, of course, the US president, he has his own plane for himself, the same as Malaysian president, uh, prime minister as well. So this definitely can mark and also lead and a very good example to not only to Indonesia, but also other nations around Indonesia as well. Mm. Another story developing is Indonesia's cabinet delay after anti-graft body blocks candidates. So this is a news that was reported recently. Um, two days ago, uh, Indonesia President Joko Widodo failed to finalize his cabinet after the country's anti-corruption agency rejected eight candidates underlying the challenge he faces in fulfilling election promises of a government free from graft. And the and he, although he is the first leader outside any political and military elite, he tried to steer clear of the traditional trading of cabinet posts for political support, aiming for a ministerial team dominated by professional technocrats. Which is interesting. In Malaysia, it would probably be our prime minister would probably choose someone for political support. If you look at most of the cabinet members, they, I mean, in, I'm talking about in the aspect of Malaysia, if you look at most of the cabinet members, they have certain interests that the prime minister need out of them, and most of them is political support. For Joko Widodo, uh, he he see it differently. He see that, let's say he choose someone for an eco- to be an economic 
minister, it is because the person has a background in economy and is a professional or an expert in the areas of economy. So that is that is the difference between the the Malaysian sides of choosing cabinet and when it comes to what Joko Widodo would do. If you like look at Malaysia, every time when the government um, um, choose a new cabinet, it's always a question mark who will be sitting on that post because it can be anyone since the the prime minister would choose someone that would support his ideology or his interests. And then uh, that, uh, with that, we can also say that it could be also biased because uh, it, it may also lead to choosing somebody who is in favor of. But whereas this one, uh, this case, the move is likely to prove the popular with the public in mm-hmm. the world's third largest democracy. But it also threatens to underm- uh, undermine the uh, political coalition that mm-hmm. already looks weak because it does not have a majority in par- parliament. That's true. That It doesn't have a majority in mm-hmm. the parliament. But it seems like it is a popular move somehow with the public mm-hmm. because they believe in, they, they have a huge trust with Joko Widodo to somehow choose the right person for the right cabinet post. And that's not easy. Uh, the news, a news conference at which the former Jakarta governor was expected to unveil his cabinet at the capital city main port was cancelled anyway because of the, can- uh, because of the eight candidates that wasn't being uh, selected but, uh, or wasn't being approved mm. by the anti graph agency. So that many people are expecting now the, uh, for uh, Widodo's choices for many mm. economic ministries. But um, addition to that, Joko Widodo said everyone wants to work quickly but what happens if we are mistaken? We need to be quick but also correct. That's true. Even his uh, Vice President Yusuf Kala, he really seriously believed in having a clean governance. A governance. So, to have a clean governance, meaning that each person that they selected has to be clean, and is a no a no go uh, other way sort of answer. It has to be like one way, which is the person has to be clean and has to have the right intention as what. Uh, sharing the vision of what Joko Widodo would want for Indonesia, and that might take a few, uh, quite some time. And they will be naming the cabinet post for all ministers by next week or this week. So all the news that we've been discussing about the Indonesian government and after Joko Widodo came to the presidency position, it looks like Indonesia is heading to a, a fresh direction uh, in in terms of their uh, the government and the political and as well as economic side. So this will sort of test his popular support from the public, which has been also boosted by the campaign promises to clean up politics in a country where people have been, you know, about a generation of graft before. Mm-hmm. Because he wants to choose professional technocrats as his cabinet members. Uh, so, in a way, it, it will be a bit different when it comes to uh, technocrats, how they work compared to politicians. Usually, politicians would choose a, the popular way mm-hmm. to gain support, to ensure that they are they remain popular but for uh, technocrats usually they would choose the way that is more pragmatic to the nation so all eyes are on Widodo's choice for the main economic Mm -hmm. ministries they will inherit problems ranging from widening current account deficits and cooling investment to the slowest growth since 2009 the market hopes that ministries related to capital markets like the finance ministry and state-owned enterprises ministry will run by technocrats. This was stated by the head of state of research at Bahana Securities, Harry Su. But then uh, when you think about this whole situation going on right now, um, it's also... Uh, uh, we can't neglect to think about the opposition party. You see, the power of opposition is still there in the government. Bravo, so, definitely he yeah. has a strong grip exactly. on so the Joko Congress. Exactly, so will feel pressure from the opposition party when he wants to head a certain direction and the opposition party can come up with their own ideas to block his ideas. They, they have to work probably twice mm-hmm. as hard for Prabowo because his name has, has not been that clean in the past so it's hard for him to prove his point another interesting part of this uh, character Joko Widodo is unlike uh, his other predecessor, uh, his other uh, 
the, the former presidents in the past, he actually would uh, is willing to choose unpopular move in order to to gain um, more momentum for the economy. For example, in Malaysia, we actually complain for the price hike, the fuel, uh, the, the the price hike in fuel and the 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 cut, the subsidy cut. But for Indonesia, Joko Widodo is uh, is expected to hike subsidized fuel prices by about half uh, by early November, a move that would save government nearly 13 billion mm-hmm. in next year. A lot of money will be saved. 30 billion is a lot of money, which can be uh, channeled towards other areas of development. So definitely. Uh, not a popular move, but a move that probably is needed in Indonesia, especially they need to regenerate their economy and especially their structure. Um, the whole structure of Indonesia is still in need of economic reform, not just political reform. Another area that is in need of a structural uh, build is the seawater. Apparently, Indonesia will be building a US dollar 263 million seawall to protect the capital city of Jakarta. And it, that is also uh, from flooding, natural disaster. Indonesia had a few cases of flooding before. And then, um, indeed, uh, Joko Widodo is investing a certain amount of money to build a huge, gigantic seawall to prevent from this natural disaster, which is another a very positive move uh, uh, from Joko Widodo's um, idea. It, it is definitely a pro-business when it comes to why he's doing this. He said that the 263 million US dollar project to build a giant sea wall along the coast of its capital Jakarta is an attempt to protect businesses and ho- and homes from flooding it, the the problem with the area in Jakarta it has been a problem since decades um uh, the sea water in Jakarta is somehow level up to the land area and because of that every time when there's heavy rain it will be flooding and i i, I was personally in, in in jakarta for a month living there and there were a time where it was raining profusely and it wouldn't stop and it ended up with some parts of in uh, roads in jakarta was so flooded that is it it was almost like your at, at your ankle when you walk or oh. above your ankle so with that uh, there is a predict effect that by 2050 jakarta will sink <laughs> due to <laughs> the rapid ground sub, uh, substance and the rising sea level and also this uh, this is actually this project is actually a promise by uh, Joko Widodo even when uh, he was our city's governor that you know this problem needs to be fixed mm-hmm. the best country to learn from how to avoid uh, the rising sea level from flooding the land area is to learn from Holland, uh, the Netherlands have always been very uh, technological advanced when it comes to how to counter high uh, rising sea level and how to make sure that the land area remains dry and good for businesses. And even for Japan, Japan's sea level is rising 1 cm by uh, yearly. So they are also doing some kind of, uh, they're coming with the methods and the system to prevent from Not that. South Korea. Not South Korea. Too. <laughs> You're still safe. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so another area that um, besides Indonesia that we are looking at is definitely uh, ri- rising in terms of the way uh, it, in rebuilding its economy. So it's is a- Vietnam. Yes. So apparently, just how you mentioned Japan. Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apparently, Japan is looking uh, at Vietnam in terms of trying in terms of diversifying its investment. And then uh, Vietnam is is actually a diverse country uh, with a lot of influences from France, Germany, and America. And then Japan sees the potential uh, to have an investment um, beyond China, an opportunity to, to for Vietnam to attract greater international in- investment. So over the past few years, Firms, uh, they have actually invested in China. They have started diversifying their investment destinations and reducing their uh, over-reliance on China.
China in what is called the China Plus One strategy. And this is a result of rising labor costs and then ongoing structural reforms in China. So indeed that Vietnam is still heavily influenced by the China, but then with the Japanese investment coming in, definitely Vietnam can uh, channel the direction to, to a new, uh, uh, new channel for the new investment area. Mm-hmm. One thing uh, interesting about um, I about Vietnam, if if you look at investment uh, number of investment in a lot of uh, Southeast Asian country, Vietnam is actually one of the top three. So it shows that Vietnam is serious about getting a lot of foreign partners to join in and invest in its economic development and Japan definitely is one of one one of the key investors we discussed yesterday about Japanese investment in Southeast Asia apparently Jap- the, uh, Jap- Japan is one of the top key investors in Southeast Asia definitely that, that shows that Japan is is willing to open up its economy in other parts of other regions of the globe and also Jap- uh, when it comes to Japanese product we can think of a lot of uh, area uh, industries from electronic industries and automobile industries and in fact those are the areas that Japan uh, Japan is is looking at when it comes to Viet- uh, investment in Vietnam and then I uh, like uh, what you uh, Arlene you mentioned uh, Vietnam is the world's fourth largest market for mo- motorcycles and so Japanese auto makers such as Honda Yamaha as well as parts and component suppliers have been investing as well. You know what's interesting about Vietnam when I was there? Um, I noticed that people there are so relaxed and motorcycles is definitely the choice of transportation. And it, it is so much easier to travel in Viet, uh, in the city of Hanoi by a bike than car because the weather was really good and then uh, the people are really charming and they have a lot of really nice little cafes they have nice little stalls selling noodles n- noodle soup and it was it was a pleasant you know going around vietnam or hanoi with your little bites and you don't you don't need anything you don't need the po- you don't need cars and you can always go to their parks they have a lot of parks in hanoi and it is a pleasant moment and definitely i would say Vietnam is the world's fourth largest market for motorcycles and it should be number one if not mm-hmm. the fourth. <laughs> Definitely. And it, it also, this country has a great potential for attracting investment for foreign firms looking at destination for the next investment, like um, to become a plus one. And Vietnam is the blessed with a young and highly educated workforce and a sizable domestic market and a ge- uh, geographical advantages as well. It has a lot of advantages. In fact, companies like Panasonic, which is a global company, is seeking market opportunities for home electronic appliances and regard Vietnam as an important part of a broader emerging market markets block. Mm-hmm. When you talk about emerging markets, ASEAN countries is definitely a very healthy emerging markets. Companies need to tap into, but it needs to tap into the right way, in a way that it benefits the society, the country, as well as uh, the, the businesses itself. Not excessive marketing uh, to the extent that it doesn't have that balance. With Japan, the reason why it's tapping into Vietnam is also because it realized that it cannot put all its eggs in China. And <coughs> and he see, it sees that they are u- reducing re- their over-reliance on China uh, which uh, which is what it was called China plus one one strategy. Now it wants to ensure that the Japan Vietnam economic partnership agreement can, uh, which came into effect uh, in 2009, will be utilized as um, as much as they can. And also, uh, what we discussed like yesterday, both Japan and Vietnam, they are involved in the TPP agreement. So with that concluded, this TPP will actually help promote and then uh, the trade and investment. And it will also accelerate and also compel domestic economic and also as well as industrial structure changes. 
On the other side of the world, which is Canada, uh, unfortunately, two days ago, there was a shooting happening, uh, Ottawa shooting, and soldier killed and city on lockdown. It was reported in BBC at the time. A gunman shot and killed a soldier at a war memorial in Ottawa before police engaged in a gun battle inside the parliament building. You would assume Canada being the, the, nice, the safest, the yeah. nicest, the nicest sister in North America. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would assume that it would not have that kind of problem where people kill each other, you know, in a very public and official place as well. And then this is already a second attack that this week targeting Canadian uh, military personnel came as a, can- a Canadian jets were to join the U.S.-led uh, bombing campaign against Islamic militants in Iraq. So it's got uh, something to do with uh, already Islamic militants and it's already influencing uh, can- um, can- Canada and also the parts around the area as well. And that actually did frighten the public. Mm-hmm. And with that, it seems like uh, Mr. Harper uh, said the attack would strengthen Canada's resolve in fight against extremism alongside its allies. Do you agree with that? I think he's just covering up. Uh, <laughs> but probably he was uh, speaking about the ISIS movement, in in which is kind of not really related to the issue about the gun the gunman. But definitely, this event was sad and tragic for the city as well as the country. Mm-hmm. So it seems like, I mean, if you look at the photos, it it seems like a, a big deal. There were military arms, uh, ar- armies, and there were SWAT teams, mm-hmm. and there were police. Probably like the whole bunch of security personnel were were there just to make sure that the the whole situation. Uh, could calm down and uh, to ensure that the gunman, the gunman was uh, being uh, um, being captured. But so yet there is no confirmation. Any of uh, you know this week's attack that could be related or linked to I, uh, ISIS or new military military it's a bit campaign. Too, it's a bit too soon to say that it's related to ISIS, right? It could be a crazy guy who said that I want to kill someone today. Yeah, who could have had this. <clears throat> grunge against somebody mm-hmm. they would have attacked mm-hmm. so uh, in a way that is still uh, a developing news uh, we are not sure yet whether it, it is the gunman is somewhat related to the ISIS or is it just another crazy guy going around killing spree so with that uh, we have to close down our news <laughs> commentary for today and continue our charming conversation on coffee and later that on. That would be very interesting because it's coffee culture is pretty new in Malaysia. We just had developing. coffee, right? We at, always have coffee Bangsa. every morning. Oh yes, <laughs> such a high class middle class. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we will continue again uh, in a bit.